Can you believe we <sighs> are here at the keynote interview? No pressure, Stacy, but we were really excited that you're here. I don't feel any pressure. I know, I know. I've been only talking to you about this for like a year. Which is why I'm so actually thrilled to be here. Um, guys, we just need to take a second and talk about the fact that my friend Nitika has spent a year, at least, putting this amazing event together, and I have not stopped hearing about it <laughs> for 365 days she since. Has it. But I'm so proud of you. It's the most amazing thing I, I, that you've done since I've known you. And it's you've true. done a lot of amazing no, because, things. Thank you. Thank you. But I always go to Stacy with all of my ideas, and I'm like, so can I do this one? Is this a good one? And she's like, no. And then, <laughs> it's true, she's just like that. And then I came to her with Chronicon, and she, you, you were approval. Like, you were just like, this is it. Yeah. This is it. So No, it, it is it. Yeah. This is just the beginning. So you yeah. guys are on the ground floor. Get ready. <laughs> yes. Well, I am so honored. I know I've said that so many times today, but I especially mean that in this moment because I am with Stacy, who is one of the greatest lights in my life. And something I just want to acknowledge is that Stacy was a light in my life long before. Sorry, long before I ever knew her. Oh, which, it's so early to start I crying. <laughs> so I already cried like five times today. It's about oh. to like all come out. Oh god. <laughs> but no, it's true. It's true. Because and I and the reason why I'm sharing that is because I know that so many of you feel the same way, right? That you were watching her on what not to wear, and yes, right? And you were just like, oh my god, who is this gorgeous woman on the screen? I can't understand what's happening. And then she was also giving us the, you know, she was giving us permission to own parts of ourselves that we were just, I mean, for me, I know I was sitting there wanting to own my psoriasis and wanting to own things about myself that I thought were just so unlovable. And then I would turn on what not to wear. And I mean, for years, I would just watch you and think to myself, like, okay, she's showing people how to do it. Like, they've got stuff, like, I've got stuff. Okay, we can do this, you know? And, and it's kind of strange how, like, you watch someone on TV and they can make that much of an impact. But you have made that much of an impact on me and on so many people in this room. So just give it up for Stacey. I'm so happy she's here. <laughs> yes. Thank you. No, it's true. And I really just want to start, you know, I know we share chronic illnesses. Yes, we do. <laughs> yes. yes, we both have psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis. A lot of which I didn't talk about on television yeah. for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of interesting that you bring up the fact that we uh, made over a lot of people on television who talked about their issues. Yeah. But it, it took a long time for me to talk about my issues on television. One, because it, I don't think it was necessarily the place to do that. It, it wasn't that the, it was something we were, I was trying to keep a secret. It was just more that the focus wasn't on that um, until it felt like something that felt important to help someone relate to their own issues. And I don't know if anybody will remember it. It wasn't like it was something so important or special, but there was a woman on the show who was very upset about uh, scars that she had from plastic surgery. And I shared with her that I had permanent scars from um, topical steroids for skin issues, uh, psoriasis, that I had. And once I showed those, that became um, an issue that was brought up quite a bit after. And that was what uh, made me start opening up a lot about having had a skin disease that I still have. I just had my tonsils taken out because I had chronic strep. And so I stopped having psoriasis recur. Uh, it doesn't mean I don't have it anymore. At that time, I didn't know I had psoriatic arthritis, which came a lot later with a lot of other problems. But yeah. it was one of the things that made me start talking about it. Yeah, because I know that for you, that you started to understand that there was something going on with your body and your health while you were really at the peak of yeah. what was going on with what not to wear. So can you talk to us a little bit about that specific part? Like what was it like to show up on that set every day and be so on, you know, and especially be on for so many people that were looking for that? Yeah, I yeah. mean, you know, it's funny. There are all these categories in television that you get awards for. Um, <laughs> nobody gets awards for the things that they don't know about, right? And you have to show up 
uh, every day, you know, sort of being jolly and happy and being like, sure, I'll do this and no problem, I'll stay an extra 12 hours for you to get that shot. But nobody knows sort of what goes on behind that. And, you know, whether it's your personal problems in your personal life and you're like bummed out because you didn't get something or you didn't get a job or you have a fight with your significant other or whatever is one thing. Um, but I was experiencing like all kinds of pain that I didn't understand. You know, one day I would fit into my shoes and the next day I wouldn't. I was bloated. I was tired no matter how much I slept. I kept trying to change my eating habits or sleeping habits or, you know, anything. And I was just constantly feeling uncomfortable. Had absolutely no idea what was causing it. Uh, it can, like, I was constantly in a bad mood, and I didn't know why. I mean, I truly wasn't connecting both the physical to the emotional at all. And it, it continued even after I left What Not To Wear. I mean, I had no idea until, I guess, maybe about a year and a half after I left. And I was actually um, doing an event for psoriasis uh, with a dermatologist, talking about, you know, what fabrics to wear, whether you want to show off your skin or you don't want to show off your skin, and what trends to wear, whether you care about your psoriasis or you don't, you know, like, empower yourself either way. And I was, I was saying to this dermatologist, I'm, I'm really sorry, I, I have to lie down, I'm tired all the time, and blah, 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 all of these symptoms, blah, 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 blah. And she was like, have you seen a rheumatologist? A, I had no idea what that was. <laughs> B, I was like, why are you telling me this? You're a dermatologist. Like, aren't you supposed to tell me something about my skin? And, uh, and you know, she said to me, talk to me about your psoriasis. And I told her that I got it when I was very young. She asked me if I'd ever had nail psoriasis. She asked me um, about my symptoms, which I said were mostly exhaustion. But I told her about the bloating and not fitting into my shoes and that my, my hands would swell up. And she said, you know, I am guessing that you have psoriatic arthritis. And I didn't even know what it was. I didn't even know that it was connected to psoriasis. And when I went to see a rheumatologist, he said, I'm guessing you have that or you have lupus, and I'm gonna know in about seven minutes. And he did a bunch of little tests on me and took, I don't know, I'd say like about 40% of my blood is what it felt like. <laughs> Um, and did a bunch of tests, and he was like, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what you have. And that's, that is what it seems to be. And then I learned that there were five different types that we had to try and figure out what type, whether I should be on medication, whether you know, I should change my diet. It, it turned into a whole journey of, of understanding autoimmune diseases on a level that I absolutely had no idea about. And just to be honest, I am 50. I turned 50 in May, which in and of itself is an accomplishment, people. Um, <laughs> wait till you get there. But, um, but, you know, when I got psoriasis, I was four. It was, there was nothing that people knew about the disease then. I, I mean, I had it so severely, I was in medical journals. Nobody knew what to do then. They were throwing, you know, crap at the wall and just trying to see what stuck. The, the field of rheumatology, Dr. Darian told me downstairs, is one of the fastest growing fields in terms of what people understand about it. So what they know about psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis now and autoimmune diseases is so much greater than what they knew back then. So I have been trying to catch up in terms of learning what it means to take care of myself uh, for the past five years at an astronomic rate. Wow, and I also just think about the fact that so many people were going to you about their confidence, right? And you were going through all of the stuff. And I wanna just understand, like, was confidence ever something that you struggled with while you were dealing with this? Because I know that's kind of like a baseline for a lot of us, right? Sure, but yeah. I mean, I was dealing with confidence my entire life. It yeah. had nothing to do with autoimmune diseases. I mean, that's why I went into fashion, because I didn't have any. You only, I mean, Personally, I think you go into fashion when you have chronic low self-esteem. You go into fashion because you think that's going to give you self-esteem. It's the exact opposite. It's an industry that runs on insecurity. It's, it makes its money out of making you feel insecure. I, I, that's why I ran towards it, because I was so insecure. Um, I don't think my confidence came out of fashion at all. I don't think my confidence came out of, you know, having an autoimmune disease either. I think it, it came from, um, from learning how to cope with both. I think it learned, you know, confidence comes out of, 
out of a lot of what I've already heard today, but I certainly think it comes from um, facing yourself and accepting yourself and that kind of self-awareness, knowing that, you know, what the fashion mill is cranking out is a bunch of bullshit, and you have to create yourself. You are the one who decides, you know, what's cool, what's fashionable, what's what's interesting, um, and what matters. And, and also, you have to decide how well you want to take care of yourself, um, what's myth and what's fact, even in health. I think that, that, you know, not everything you read is true, and not everything you read is going to work for you. You need to do your homework. Um, there's a lot that people say, even about autoimmune diseases, it's still a very amorphous field of health. Not everything works for everybody. Um, not eating gluten is a thing that seems to work really well for autoimmune people, but, uh, you know, all of a sudden everybody who, uh, you know, lives and breathes thinks that not eating gluten is good for them. Not true. Yeah. Untrue. Yeah. So like knowing your body, knowing exactly what you need is the way that you help people get confidence. Is that what you're yes, trying to say? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I, and that's, I mean, I, I think that that's, that's true of everything. That's certainly how I talk to people about style. Yeah. I mean, I am not the person who I was on what not to wear. I can't be. You evolve. Everyone evolves. Um, that's true of the way that you feel about yourself at a certain age. And as I've evolved in terms of my age, my opinion about style has changed. You do you. I'm not really interested in imposing my, my style rules on you anymore. I think that that was more of a construct of a television show. Um, that doesn't mean that I want you to go, you know, like careening off the rails. Like, I'm going to be the rails for you. But you choose the car and you choose the destination and the color and the make and the model. And, and you know, I just want to keep you from, like, crashing into the ocean into a million pieces. But the idea being, like, decide what you want to get out of your style. What is it? You know, do you want to, is it just self-expression? Well, self-expression in a vacuum doesn't really do anything for you. What is your self-expression by you? What are you interested in getting out of your self-expression? What, what do you want to say about yourself? And, and, and where do you want to go? So what are your goals? How can I help you achieve those goals? That's what I would say I want to do as a stylist or as some sort of counselor for your style. But it's very different than saying, you know, don't forget to accent your waist and wear a pointy toe shoe. Like, fuck that. If you haven't gotten that down by now, you don't need me. <laughs> Oh, okay, so speaking of self-expression and following your yes, dreams. Yes, sorry for the expletive. No, no, no. No, 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 it's fine. We are I'm way past streaming. that this right. day. Okay. Um, <laughs> we, told, we told a lot of people not to do it, and it's fine. It adds character, I think someone said. So, um, so you're fine. Um, no, but speaking of self-expression and really doing what you want to do, I know a lot of people in the audience are following their dreams and working towards really just creating that life for themselves and figuring out how to follow their dreams while they have a chronic condition. And so I really would love to hear what your experience with that is and also it's what would not you easy. tell people? Yeah, I, yeah, tell me, I, I mean, tell me everything. I, I have to be honest, some days I, I, I really look around me and I think what must it be like not to have anything? What must it be like to wake up and not feel bad and not have your body hurt? And, oh, I could get really emotional about this one. Some days I wonder what it must be like not to wake up and not feel bad, not just physically but emotionally, because there are days where I wake up and my body hurts and it's so exhausting and it makes me so depressed and just, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I didn't know I would get a clap for that, but, um, but I just, I get so tired and that's at 50, but I felt that way at 30. And, that's the thing that sometimes really strikes me. If you know anything about autoimmune diseases, I'm sure you know that there are a lot of comorbidities that um, come along with them. So psoriasis, for example, there's a lot of data that says that um, depression is uh, very common with psoriasis. Well, they can't prove that that's caused by psoriasis, but it makes a lot of sense to me that it would be something that you would have along with it. And one, because I've had it. And two, because, yeah, psoriasis, it, it, it may not kill you. It's, it can't kill you, but it is exhausting to have it. Your skin cracks, it breaks, it bleeds. Um, it can, um, you know, people 
young kids used to look at me and think I was a monster. And it can be psychologically exhausting. And, you know, along with that comorbidity is a raise in heart disease. And that's not surprising either, because when you are so ashamed of the way you look, you may not want to go out. And that can be depressing, but that may mean you also may stay inside a whole lot and not move around a lot. And therefore, your uh, you know, chances of heart disease are higher. There are so many things that go along with being tired all the time, or hurting all the time, or swollen all the time, that don't seem like they're very serious things to people who don't have them. And that's the one thing that I think is sometimes very hard to convey, is like, yeah, I know, my ankles being swollen isn't that big a deal, but when you have it every single day, when um, for the first time <laughs> I actually looked at my closet for all those heels that I'm famous for, and I thought, I'm gonna get rid of them. It's time. Like, I just, what's the, I mean, I am wearing heels today because I just wanted to impress you people. Um, it's working. <laughs> but, um, but, I, what? Rockies? Rothies? No. I'm not there yet. Get a worker into but it. I worker didn't, into I, it. But I did, in fact, get some cool sneakers yesterday. But anyway, but um, but you know, the idea is that it is constantly about having to let go of who you were and become who you are. And sometimes, and I say that to people all the time in terms of style evolution, it's harder when you know you used to think of yourself in this one way. I mean, that's not true. I was gonna say it's harder to think of yourself in that one way when it was like, oh, you know, you used to think of yourself as like this healthy, vibrant person, but that's bullshit. It's hard to let go of who you were no matter what you were when, when you think of yourself in a different light that feels like what you're letting go of is so hard to say goodbye to. And I've been dealing with that the, as I age. You know, age, saying goodbye to my youth has been super, super hard. I have a lot of friends, like my friend Nitty. I have a lot of friends who are a lot younger than me. And sometimes when I realize like, I really am not that young, I cannot keep up in the same way, or even in the sense that it's their time. You know, I feel like, I feel like what not to wear was my time, and this is something different. This stage of my life is something different. It's really hard to say goodbye to that. It's hard to say goodbye and realize like, it's, 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 you know, I've got to be here to support my girls. And, well, I mean, I have to be. You, you, you know, you're who I believe in. But it's like, it's hard to say goodbye to, to youth. It's hard to say goodbye to um, all the opportunities that were in front of you and realize that there was do decrease and you have to look at your life in a different way. Um, I feel that a lot with my autoimmune diseases because they are getting worse. They just are. Thanks. I'm so moved by you. <laughs> Your vulnerability is such a gift, really. It's like straight to my heart. Thank you so much. I really hate um, it, God. <laughs> I know you do. I know, that's why I'm really acknowledging her for it. <laughs> I mean, doing great. I, the worst thing in the world is to be this emotional for me, I hate it. I know. And he always gets me to be this emotional. I can't stand it's it. It's a miracle, it's a miracle we're friends. No, it really, it's amazing. It is a miracle. It's a miracle. No, it's an amazing gift from God. Um, no, so what I, what I want to talk about based on what you just said, is something that's coming up for me a lot with what everything you're saying is that the basic reason why I wanted to do Chronicon was to break the cycle of isolation. And a lot of what you're saying, whether it's the grief or you know just being in a silo with what you're going through with your body, um, I just wanna know, like, have you experienced that feeling of isolation? And then like, if you have, what do people do about that if they're going through the same thing? Don't do it. <laughs> um, Don't isolate? I, yeah. Okay. I mean, I think I spent most of my life isolating. I think, unfortunately, the biggest problem with that was that it made um, faking it that much harder. It took all my energy to pretend that I wasn't doing that and that I was like out in the world like, jazz hands, I'm fabulous, everything is so great. And then I would come home and collapse and not be able to function. And, um, and that even happens sometimes now. But when I look around me and I see other people who are suffering, who are really isolating, um, I can spot them almost immediately. Like, I can look them in the eyes and be like, oh, girl, I know what you are doing. And it is, um, it's like dying an early death. 
it's like that isolation, you might as well be in a grave because it's just, it's the worst possible place to be. And um, I know it feels safe. I know it feels like if nobody knows what's happening to you and you're you know, quiet about it, it's like you can almost pretend like nobody knows what's going on so that when you, you know, when you reemerge, you can pretend like you were out somewhere doing something fabulous, but you know, you're chipping away at yourself that way. And even if it means that you just talk to somebody on the phone, even if it means that you don't go outside, it's all the moments that you, that you stay inside your head, that you don't talk to anybody, um, that you do yourself a disservice. You know, there are only so many minutes you have on the planet, and I know it sounds silly to say, um, but you really, you really need to spend them with people. Um, shit, I hate you, Nitika. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone you. is crying. First of all, um, I, and I really, the end of the day, like it's it it's released. the end of the day. The That's release. what it is. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. I say this because yeah. I did. I spent a lot of my life doing this, and I, I, I lost my dad last year, and I wish that I'd spent more time with him and less time isolating. Because if I'm, if there was anything in the world I could take back, it would be that. It would be more time just sitting with him, even if I wasn't talking and less time isolating. And, you know, I got psoriasis from him. I, I got it from my mom. I got the double whammy, like, autoimmune gene. We never talked about it. We never talked about, like, all of the things that, like, what a pain in the ass it was, or, like, it was, like, this weird thing that we weren't supposed to talk about, that somehow it was, like, an embarrassment. Mm -hmm. Like, and I think back now, I remember that my grandparents blamed each other, my parents for, I mean, me having it as a child, all of this unnecessary strife when really, like, who cares? Like, a lot of bad things go down in the world. A lot of bad things happen to great people. Like, that's just the way it is. I wish that we had just spent more time together. That's what I really wish. And so if you are isolating, um, I really encourage you, whether you start a group, find a group, or already have like a really good group of people who you know will understand and you're just not reaching out because you are depressed, which by the way, is like nothing to be ashamed of in the first place. As I said, most comorbidities um, with autoimmune diseases include depression. I highly, highly recommend that you talk to someone, anyone, talk to you. I mean, also having an animal, a Furby, <laughs> nothing better than that. Nothing better than that. Yeah, I find that when I'm going through my darkest periods of isolation, the thing that really does save me is calling people. Um, it, it just brings me out of it. Like even if I physically can't leave the house, I'm yeah. just like, okay, I'm gonna call probably you or V or Allison or something, you know, just anyone and make you talk to me for like an hour. <laughs> Yeah. It's so true. make sure you have friends who have an hour to like <laughs> just sit on the phone and yeah. listen to you talk. I mean, it's so important. Um, okay. Well, uh, I just want to take a deep breath. So for, me too. Yeah, I know. <sighs> it's so you're doing you're doing great. Um, so because I know so many of you are so excited that Stacy was joining us today, I wanted to make sure that we really honored. Um, and had some time to talk to her. So we have a little bit of time for Q&A um, with all of you. And I would love for you to raise your hand if anybody has a question. Oh, okay. oh a well, gentleman so in the we, back there's just a gentleman raised in the his back. hand right raised away. His hand. You're hey getting now. a microphone right there next to you. Please say your name and tell Howdy. us what your question is. Um, my name is Brandon. Hey, Brandon. I'm 23 years old. Um, I can be your mother. I'm terrified. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, so I was um, born HIV positive, and a lot of the stuff I'm dealing with now, I never really got to process as a kid. So like now, <clears throat> I'm doing things like I'd never really done before, like isolating myself or like keeping myself around a certain number of people. And like back to the isolation thing, like um, a person who is... Um, what is it, extroverted? Mm -hmm. Extroverted personality. I can feel myself kind of turning into an introvert and just, I'd rather just stay away from the BS than rather just be involved in it, good or bad. So like, what is your advice to like, yank myself out that mood? 
Um, I don't know if I asked that right. You're yeah, perfect. You're perfect. perfect. You're perfect. There's no, there's no right or wrong there. I, it, there's two things. I think extroverts and and introverts. Those are those are personality types, right? And I don't, I don't believe that you have to be one or the other. I believe we can all be ambiverts, and um, uh, which is, you know, really being like, you know, ambidextrous, right? You can write with your left hand or your right hand. I mean, I don't know if we can all do that. Uh, <laughs> But I do believe we can have both sets of personalities. And I think that they can both serve us, right? Um, and when you say that you find yourself being more introverted, do you think that that's because, uh, I'm, I'm, ask, I'm asking your question, I'm answering oh. your question with a question, but do you find that you're doing that because you feel protective, like you feel like people could hurt you? Or is it that you feel that um, you see what else is out there and you don't want to deal with it? So like, I work with a lot of, a lot. I work with a nonprofit and like a couple of them, like one with kids, one with adults, and like it's just a lot of personalities. So like I feel like some of the emotions that I surround myself around kind of like tether latch on to me and it's like I don't wanna say PTSD or say something wrong of that nature, but like I feel myself kinda of like giving into the secondhandness of the emotions that's been around? Sure. I mean, you're an empath. That's what you're saying, is that yeah. that energy takes its toll on you because you feel it. So I understand that. And I think that you, you need to be careful because of a lot of people who, like you, who can feel the emotions of other people are going to be exhausted by them. Mm -hmm. um, so in that case, I do think it is important that you find a way to recharge. Now that may be that you do need to spend some time by yourself, but that may also be that you need to be around other people whose energy gives, uplifts you, right? And gives you a sense of positivity and, and feeling like, ah, relief. Um, so empaths can work either way, right? You can be around people who are quite positive and that gives you a sense of real joy. Um, I think you just have to find the balance or it may just mean that you need, you know, to meditate and like take yourself to the movies. But regardless, it's, long, it's really, that's a question of self-awareness and self-discovery because I think at, at 23, you're very young, you're gonna find your way as you go. If you already know that your energy is quite affected when you're around other people, now you have to calibrate and you're gonna have to decide, okay, well that energy is like heavy for me. So either I balance that with energy from other people that, that really lifts me and kind of balances me out or I need to find a way to keep myself in check so that that energy doesn't bring me down. Awesome sauce, thank you. you. Yep. Awesome sauce, I used to say that all the time. Yes, yes, right here, you had your hand up. Excuse me. Yeah, oh, there's gonna be a microphone right behind you that's gonna get to you, yeah. I wanna hear you, yeah. Do I have to stand up? Okay. Sure, um, go for it. So I'm, I'm curious about... What's your name? Carolina, sorry. Hi, Hi. I also have psoriasis and other things, um, so I feel you. Um, but I'm curious about particularly work-life balance. Um, I'm a journalist, and it's a field of martyrdom. <laughs> Everyone is trying to outsuffer the person next to them. Um, and <sighs> yeah. <laughs> Okay. I quit my job. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm really curious, you know, you, you are a successful person, you've achieved a lot, and I'm wondering how you found that balance and how you advocated for yourself, um, because sometimes you can advocate for yourself and it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, employers don't really care. So, yeah, lots going on there. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, I wish that I'd advocated for myself more, to be honest. I, the best thing that ever happened to me was that um, I got fired from Mademoiselle um, when I was 30. And I wish that I'd left two years before I got fired, but I was lazy. And I was like, well, you know, they let us take cars home at night and I have a 401k and who cares whether I really hate it here? <laughs> I mean, you know, who cares? I don't know what else I want to do. I got fired and, 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 you know, I wandered around for a year really not knowing what the hell I wanted to do. And then I wound up auditioning for some show I didn't understand or really, it like, wasn't even clear what channel it was on or <laughs> why I would even do television. But, you know, P.S., it was what not to wear. But <laughs> it even with that, I stayed too long. I mean, by year five, I knew that I didn't want to be there anymore. Not that I didn't love what the show was doing. It was that it was just getting to be, I mean, we did 60 shows in one year, new shows. We had no time off. I was exhausted. And that is probably when the arthritis started and I didn't even realize it. 
And I wasn't advocating for myself because it was a non-union show and they made the rules. And the show, we weren't producers, we were just talent for hire. And if I think about it now, we should have put a lot of provisions in place that we didn't. And even by the time that I said I was leaving, um, that was before they decided to cancel the show. And I said that I was leaving, I you know, said I was gonna do that last season. They were still gonna keep going with the show. The decision to cancel was much later. I wish that I had advocated more for myself. But here's the thing, we live in a world of overachievers. And the decision to advocate for your health, the work-life balance has to be yours. It is always going to be in your court. It is not going to be because some company decides, you know, you're right. You absolutely deserve more time off, especially as a journalist. I don't know whether you're working for a publication or you're freelance, but particularly if you're freelance, that is truly, I know that that, that means that you, your life is a lot riskier in terms of um, stability, but I really think that is the best way in order to have work-life balance because then the choices are in your hands. Yeah. Uh, the minute that you are working for uh, a corporation is the minute that you are going to lose those choices. And the fact is, nobody is ever gonna tell you that your health is a priority except you. I really believe that. Yeah. I, I don't think that we live in a culture where, um, where health is a priority. I mean, in capitalism, health is not a priority. And particularly for women, in my opinion. Yes. I'm a freelancer now, by the way. <laughs> Good for you. For that reason. Thank you. Nitika's choosing the people. All I right, can't I'm make these it's decisions. Fine, it's fine, you're fine, you're fine. Go ahead, and then we'll get to you after. Yeah. Go ahead, yeah. Thank you. Hello. Hi. First of all, love the hair. I was about to tell you, um, when I turned 40, What's your name? One of the things that Brandy wanted to do was something new, and I said, I'm going to stop dyeing my gray hair so Amen. I can look like Stacey London on that show. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> But also, with you, you kind of touched me when you said when you were getting closer to certain ages and you can't do some of the things that you used to do. I want to know what are you doing now and what's bringing you joy? Because just because we're getting older and our knees hurt a little bit, we can't just stop going. But I found a lot of inspiration from you in the show, so I have high expectations of you now. So. Um, All right, Brandy is so, putting it down. Okay. <laughs> I want to know what is what is Stacy London doing now? What's I'm retired. No, I'm good. Uh, well, first of all, I'm, my knees do hurt right now because I fell down the stairs and they really hurt. So I can't put my legs behind my head anymore. Mm. Me neither. Sorry. <laughs> um, no, I'm, I mean I'm 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 actually doing a couple of things. I am working on a new show. I mean, we'll see what happens. Um, I am writing. And I started this new little company that's sort of in beta right now, which is completely different from anything I've ever done before. It is a pure passion project. It has to do um, <clears throat> with sustainability, has nothing to do with clothing. It has everything to do with things that I love. Um, it's a membership only company and it's not, it hasn't, Air, it, it, I said it hasn't aired yet. It hasn't. It hasn't launched yet. But um, but you'll be sure to know when it does. But it's something that I've been working on for a little while, and I'm really proud of it and very excited about it. So is, is this passion product because of your diagnosis? No. Of, of oh no no no. That you get into? Why are you no. just going to do what you want to do now? Because Why? I can. I'm doing what I want to do now because I can, and and because that's part of the evolution. Because I, I realized that I had been doing things that I think that I thought people expected of me. That's, that's really what uh, was holding me back a little bit, is that I thought, right, okay, well, I have to come out with a clothing line, or, or I need to do a book about style, or, you know, I have been working on this book about aging, but I keep running into a wall with it. There's something that's like not working for me. I mean, I have thousands of pages and yet I can't edit it. It's like, it keeps changing on me and it's not coming out the way I want it to. So I just stopped and I was like, I need to take a step back. There's something that's not working. What is it that I really wanna do? And to be fair, 
my dad's death really put stuff in perspective for me. I, I felt like I had, I was, I, I don't know if any of you are aware that the past few years have been a little bit tricky. I had pretty massive spine surgery and that kind of knocked me down for a bit. And I came back from that and I was like getting really strong and I put all my energy into getting like physically strong. And then my dad got really sick and I took care of him and then he died. And that just knocked me on my knees, <laughs> literally. And, um, and then I was coming back from that, and I really thought, like, I, I don't want to do what people expect anymore. I don't care what, what everybody expects from me. I want to do what I want to do, because there is so little time left in the world. What is it that really matters to me? So aside from, like, the expectation of, like, okay, I, I know that I like dressing people. I, I know that I care about that. But I'm sort of done with that phase. What is it that I want to do now? Now what I'm doing is something I really want to do. I'm just not ready to launch it. But as soon as I am, you will know. You want me to do it? I can come over here. This is Molly, and she has MS. Hi. Uh, yes. Hi, Molly. Yeah. Hi, I'm Molly. I have MS. Hi, Molly. So, and... Well, I've asked a question <laughs> every time. So, um, Molly, we love participation. <laughs> yeah. So, my name's Molly, and I have MS. And my dad died. Um, I don't, I don't know how many years ago. Over a decade ago. And right after that, I got diagnosed with MS in between college and grad school. And the grieving process of grieving your healthy body was, I didn't cry any of the other times these not. people <laughs> were witnesses. But how do you deal with the grieving process of grieving your healthy self when it comes to, like, when does that end? I know grieving my dad will never end, obviously. <laughs> But I have people to talk to about that type of stuff. Um, when it comes to MS, because all of our st we're all snowflakes and we're all different, it's very um, isolating was the word <laughs> that really hit. Um, how do you deal with this grieving process of your healthy self? That's really, that's a really tough question. I'm not, I don't even know if I know the answer to that one. In, a, in, in one sense, um, I don't know that I've ever, I don't even know if I've ever had a healthy enough self to grieve. I got diagnosed with psoriasis when I was so young. Um, and I, I wrote a little bit about this in my book, but one of the things that I, I'll never forget is when I went to my mom and I, I could feel this like weird skin on the back of my ear. That's how I knew I, something, I, I, I had something. Because I went up to her and I was like rubbing it. And I looked at her and she looked at me and said, what's wrong with you? I didn't say anything. That's how she answered me. And I remember thinking, well, what is wrong with me? Like there is something wrong with me. And unfortunately, I feel like that's what I've always felt. So the idea of grieving a healthy self isn't so much the grief of, of missing one as much as the grief of wishing that there was one. So it's slightly different for me um, than, I think the, that for me it's much more envy when I think about people who wake up in the morning and wake up and sort of just happy and get out of bed and, and don't have a thing. You know, so, but for you, I think it is, uh, it must be a very different process and one that is also tied to the grief of losing your father. I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, I wish I had an answer for you. And if anybody here does, then, then you guys should talk to Molly because that's a really big one. I also wore overalls for two years straight because I wanted to be nominated for your show. <laughs> Like you dressed not for success because you wanted. <laughs> that is brilliant. I, I don't know I, why uh, I did not think of I'm that. I'm shocked that nobody <laughs> nominated you, to be honest. They were uh, denim overalls with uh, pinstripes. <laughs> I swear. <laughs> okay, we have time for one more question. We don't really even have time for it, but I'm going to do it. Uh, go ahead, right here. 
You can just pass it back. I'm speechless. <laughs> <laughs> that was amazing. Thank you for that. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sienna. Um, I have psoriasis and I'm an advocate for psoriasis um, on social media. And uh, yesterday I sat down with a friend who I hadn't seen in a while and um, I asked him, I, I'm working on being more vocal with my friends about what I need. And um, I sat, uh, sort of in my own kind of subtle way asked him why he hadn't really been there for me in a way that felt uh, like was what I needed and um, asked me how I was and checked in with me because I had just been through a very difficult uh, three months mental health wise. Um, sorry. And he said to me that he was just so used to seeing me be so strong um, and that all of my friends, all of our friends group felt that way. And that was kind of shocking to me because I felt so weak and had, had been feeling that way for so long. So my question to you would just be, have you ever dealt with that situation and how you kind of navigate that? Um, excellent question, yes. Uh, yeah, most people don't ever ask me if I need help because I don't ever ask for help. I don't, I don't, um, I used to pride myself on not asking for help because I was so humiliated with the idea of asking for help. Um, I do highly recommend, um, there's a TED talk Amanda Palmer gave called The Art of Asking uh, that I really do recommend watching. Um, not that it's like perfect for this conversation, but I think just in general, it's a, it's a good one to watch. It is very, very hard for anybody to ask for help, period. But I think that um, when you are feeling uh, humiliated, already about what's going on with you when you feel like the other for not, you know, feeling like you're normal. Um, asking for help and feeling vulnerable to begin with and having the possibility be that somebody will say no or laugh at you or um, minimize what you're feeling because they can't see that something is truly wrong uh, is so terrifying that you go in the opposite direction. And for most of my life, I have like spent, uh, I mean, it's part of the reason I got the job at What Not To Wear. I'm so great at being kind of mean and nasty because I'm really good at faking being brave. So you kind of have to be the extra, um, you have to be extra sensitive with people who think that you're the opposite. And that also means being um, extra vulnerable, which is even harder than being, than just asking for help. It means being um, extra open and, and extra raw. And, and all of those people who think that you're so strong need to know that the opposite is true about you. Now, that doesn't mean that they are the people who will be able to help you, but they have no shot of helping you if you aren't your authentic self with them. No shot. And sadly, that, that means that some people in your community are going to do, they're going to do the wrong thing, even if they don't mean to do the wrong thing. But people are going to reveal themselves for who they truly are eventually and get it out of the way. What I realized this year, more than any other time in my life, are my friends, the real friends that I have in the world, are the ones who stepped up without me really having to prove how much I needed them when my dad died. And some, some I did have to tell, some I had to say, like, this, this I didn't realize, like, how awful this was going to feel. I didn't realize how much I was gonna miss him. I didn't realize how broken I was gonna feel. But some people actually instinctively understood, wow, this is when we step in. Now, not everybody's gonna be that way. But when it is a lifelong thing, this is, these are the people who need to know this is, the, this is the panic button. This is the thing when you say you need help, they step up. And that doesn't mean you get mad at everybody else. That doesn't mean that you are resentful towards everybody else. What it means is the way I think about it is if everybody was a horse, stay with me. <laughs> and they're all tied to a tether of some kind, right? Every tether is a different length and they're all tied to the same post. When they run, some can run faster than others and some can run farther away from that post and some can't. The, the ones that run the farthest are the ones that you call for the most important things. And the ones that, you know, can't run as far, you take to the movies. 
Oh, so good. Thank you, Stacy. It is. Thank you, Nitty. Sort of. <laughs> it's such an honor.